Zillow. I am your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to talk about a lot of different things that are happening within the city and the state of Montana. Today, it is Friday, um, July 17th. I'm recording this a day in advance, but um, here are some of the more related things that are happening within the news. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some movies and streaming stuff that are coming out this weekend as well as um, just general events that are kind of happening and keeping the beat on what's uh, happening in the city of Missoula. And one of the biggest things that happened, of course, last week is that uh, masks, requirement for masks inside businesses, and the liability is putting on the businesses as well. Uh, but now uh, the state of Montana has kind of upped that to uh, mandatory mask wearing to any public gatherings of 50 or more people, um, places of business, places of gathering, and it's an order to mandate the wearing of masks and putting the authority on the uh, public health officials in your local towns across the state of Montana. And part of the power implies that, uh, I like to think of it as like health code violation. But during this pandemic, uh, certain uh, powers are temporarily, temporarily granted to such public local public health officials to allow them to basically close down places unless they come up to code. So a lot of times, um, instead of kind of putting it on the people. It's been put more on the places that host places of gatherings, bars, uh, restaurants, um, public uh, spaces, you know, if you have any kind of events that are happening. Um, many events have been being canceled, but there are still a bunch of events and other uh, venue hosting areas that have places of gathering, which will require masks. And this is complaint driven, so it's not necessarily uh, one of those things that they're going to have police officers patrolling the area or health officials patrolling the area. But the biggest thing is that if you have people, uh, have the ability to contact their local health officials to make sure it's moving forward on that as well. Um, so one of the things also um, I'm going to talk about is that in uh, national news as well, um, um, actually let me go back to the following places um, that are... Uh, these are the following places that require masks, businesses, nonprofit or otherwise, government offices, indoor space, open to the public, organized outside activities, 50 or more regarding phase two, uh, sponsored events, festivals, parking lots of private properties. Uh, they're, they're, they're mostly talking about like if you have like a radio uh, kind of like a uh, pilot, uh, pilot spot, like, you know, the radio is going live from... Um, University Motors or whatever, um, and they have some kind of gathering there. So that's some, that's one of the things that also does this. And this also, uh, if you have a community that has uh, less than four active COVID-19 cases, um, they still ask you to wear a mask, but it's not required. But if a community has four or more active COVID cases, they're asking people to wear masks no matter what. Um, Mary Trump. That's the niece of our president, Donald Trump. She wrote a book about him, which was being blocked by uh, Donald Trump's younger brother. Um, and one of the things that part of this is that the book is called Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man. Using her background as a trained psychologist, Mary Trump used her insight into Donald's upbringing through her father and grandfather's, Fred Trump Sr.'s ambitious real estate empire. Of course, um... No, I just want to talk a little bit about that, but now let's uh, switch gears. One of the things that uh, the economy, it's kind of a, it's kind of like a interesting kind of deal, but that hasn't really stopped construction in the city of Missoula. Missoula Development Services offers staff issued 1,656 building permits in the first quarter of 2020. According to the Missoulian, the total market value of construction for building permits issued for, from January through March was 40. $3.7 million. This is from the Missoulian. Um, Missoula's YWCA is on track to finishing up within the year or early next. Um, several large-scale projects are underway in Missoula, including work on the expanded Missoula International Airport, a new $36 million Missoula Public Library. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs is building a huge new clinic on West Broadway. DJ and A Engineers, Planners and Surveyors is building a multi-story office building on West Broadway as well. So there's a lot of stuff happening, including the mega, the huge $100 million project that's on the Riverfront Triangle. That's the uh, big project that um, uh, Nick Jacoda with uh, Logjam Presents and the City of Missoula are working on building a hotel, Civic Center, and Entertainment Center, just a huge kind of venue place, hotel, uh, uh, convention center kind of space. 
Uh, if you if you ever gotten a chance to watch any of the MRA plans about this, it is quite ambitious. It's very unique um, to Missoula as well. And I think uh, personally, the coolest part about it is that um, the uh, loading trucks for the venue would basically pull up right in front of the building, unload, and be right there on stage make it easier for a lot of roadies to pack in and pack out for a lot of those concerts. That's the one thing that really kind of struck me. MRA, they're talking a little bit more about this. They have uh, public comments, and I believe they host these meetings Thursdays. Um, but, of course, we'll talk more how the city plans on creating uh, affordable housing. That's one of the things that is kind of lacking in the city of Missoula, but uh, Missoula is working on a uh, housing trust within Missoula to help build and invest in affordable housing in uh, my city council report, but first, let's check out what's new on MCAT right now. And typically when we have an emergency, we start where the red circle is that reads disaster. From here, we move through a series of steps in the clockwise direction. So we respond to the incident, we rehabilitate and recover from the incident, and then we take measures to try and prevent and mitigate that incident in the future, and then we'll prepare for it if we can't prevent it. Um, so surrounding these, um, in the middle of these steps are the four pillars of stability. And these are things that a society needs in order to accurately and effectively complete each portion of the emergency management cycle. So what's the, what's the creature that, that creates these kinds of systems? You know, in the restoration world, I think people tend to talk about beavers as a tool, right? They're out there building dams and creating ponds. And they don't give much thought to the beavers themselves, but beavers are actually evolutionary marvels. And I think it's, I think it's worth taking a, a real quick moment to just talk about this, this incredible animal. Um, so what kind of, what's, what's a beaver? What kind of animal is a beaver? Somebody just shout it out. It's a rodent, yeah. It's, uh, it's North America's largest rodent. What's the, what's the world's largest rodent? Yeah, of course, you guys are good. You guys know your wildlife. Um, how much, what, is a, what does a beaver weigh? How big, how big is an adult beaver? 50 pounds, yeah, you, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys got this. Um, so beavers, of course, they're, they're semi-aquatic rodents, right? So, so they, they spend most of their life uh, in, in the water, and they have all kinds of incredible adaptations for this really unique semi-aquatic niche that they have. Um, first of all, they have incredibly dense fur. So beavers actually have as many individual hairs on a postage stamp size patch of skin as we humans have on our entire heads. So amazingly dense fur. Uh, CIA, Pentagon, uh, the deep state, here we were, yet again, overthrowing a regime, only this time we just overthrew an ally right on his border. And that's when I think he just said, I am done with these Americans, I'm done dealing with them, I'm done with their clubs, we're going to strike back. And that's when he sees Crimea as payback to that revolution, and when that was pretty easy, that's when he decided to go into eastern Ukraine, and then two years later, that's when he decided to go on the offensive against us and do, in his view, what he thinks we've been doing all around the world, meddling and interfering in our elections here in the United States. And now it's time for a little thing I like to call pre-critic. Pre-critic is a section of my show, a segment, as you may call it, as many people do, is where I prejudge a movie based on its title and maybe a little bit of the synopsis, and I kind of go headfirst into what I think this movie is going to become. All right, Psych 2. Uh, Electric Boogaloo, uh, otherwise known as Lassie Come Home. Um, Lassie is the name of a character in that show. All right, so uh, we welcome back a very popular show on USA Channel. You know, that channel. Never heard of it. Okay, uh, Psych. Okay, there's some people who know about it, but what about, it's kind of like Monk. You know, Tony Shalhoub Monk. All right, anyways. 
Uh, watch this lovable duo with the powers of deduction solve crimes in a town that has virtually no crimes, um, Santa Barbara. So uh, it's kind of like they solve more crimes in the show than there ever been crimes in Santa Barbara as a whole. Blah blah blah. Um, <laughs> it's a town. It's a pretty small city, town, whatever. It's one of those coastal cities where it's like a million. Two million dollars to have a shack on the beach. Um, they have to go home and save the day. Things are not as simple as they always are, or are they? And uh, you got to stick with the formula because otherwise you won't be able to solve the crime. Blah blah. Things go wrong, but also things go very right. Um, and of course, uh, things only go right if they follow the formula. And that's the uh, uh, moral of a sequel TV movie that's coming out to streaming now. Um, cursed 2020. Here is a uh, show. Um, it's a show about being cursed. Cursed 2020 stars people from other Netflix shows because nobody's making movies anymore in this climate. Uh, synopsis time. A teenager sorceress named uh, Nemu uh, encounters a young Arthur. Okay, it's Arthurian legend. You know, you don't need to know much about it, but it's from the perspective of the cursed sorceress girl, blah, 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 things happen, dragons, blasting, all that stuff, just kind of overhyping, um, you know, pre-Britannia, British rulership, just kind of romanticizing um, British imperialism in the uh, olden days. Or make it a little more appealing towards medieval junkies. Uh, curse, something tells me this has, kind of has to go off. Um, so the whole kind of story is that they're doing the proverbial carrot over the cursed person and they have to figure out how they're going to do it. But if they solve it too quickly, then it's one of those shows that's just like, eh. I mean, if they solve it within the first episode and they still make you interested in it, it's a good show. But if, if they keep on having that carrot over there the, the whole entire time, it's not that great. Cursed on Netflix. Ghost of Shushima. Ghost of Shushima. Hey, Sekiro. Shadows Died Twice was really popular. Let's we'll travel back to the 13th century Japan to enjoy a little bit more of sneak kill, sneak kill, violent, 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 swords, assassination, all great stuff. And also more like Dark Souls where you actually die more often than you actually live, but you learn to not die as much, blah, 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 things happen, level up, fight bosses, and then die to those simple tiny bosses, but beat those really big bosses where they have quick time events. Yeah, so that's basically this game. And that about does it for my uh, pre-critic segment. Now let's throw it over to some dubbing stuff. And dubbing stuff, we're talking about werewolf, or werewolf, singular, in the girls' derm dormitory. It's an actual movie from 1962. Check it out. <laughs> All right. All right, you party animal. <laughs> Time to... <gasps> oh, you really... You're an animal, aren't you? Uh, yes. Well, I don't really like the looks of him. But maybe we should put him down. Well, I don't know about that. Usually you gotta neuter him first. Uh, I'm dying. Thank you. You know, I'd rather not be neutered. Oh man, come on, we do this every single time. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? Um... Well, you say you want a bisectomy, but then you, like, chicken out, but you always tell us that we have to uh, make sure you like get the... Sounds like you're putting words in my mouth. No, I'm just repeating what well, you, you said. you should to... know better. You shouldn't listen to me. I say a lot of crazy stuff. But this is, like, the uh, ninth time you've asked us uh, just... to make sure you get a vasectomy. Well, just because I say I want one, and then chicken out, as you say, uh, doesn't necessarily mean... I'm ready for a vasectomy. I'm really trying here. And you're making this very difficult for me. It's just not fair. You've sired so many kids. I know, I know. And then when their moms try to get alimony from me, I tell them no. And then they get really mad. But I think one of those mothers finally got me. They finally stabbed me. In a very, very bad place. Charlie! Listen to me. Listen to me. What is it, Frank? I need you to liquidate my assets. Okay, that's easy. And hide them away... ...from my children. Ugh.
I got a vasectomy years ago. <sighs> Gross. Well, you know, some of his kids are pretty nice, you know. But most of them are just terrible. But, you know, they've kind of been poisoned by their mother. But well, for good this reason. wasn't quite the day that he was expecting. Huh. Want to grab fast food? Hey guys, welcome back. One of the biggest things that are happening within the city of Missoula is that they are restructuring the water utility payment plan. Um, this has to do in regards to uh, wastewater, uh, storm water, and of course the water bill. Um, as of course, as you know, just a little history is that the city of Missoula uh, acquired um, through legal action uh, the Mountain Water Company, now known as uh, the Missoula Water Company or Missoula Water Utility, um, and now they're figuring out a, a, a monthly pay schedule to kind of encompass everything to do with water within the city of Missoula, and they're moving forward on this. Um, so they talk a little bit more about it. Uh, this is Melanie uh, Hobart, uh, FC, FCS Focus Group, to create a study that reflects these changes. Here she is. Looking at the proposed new rates, as I mentioned before, we're proposing a base charge and a flow charge. The base charge consistent um, with the current admin fee will be charged per account for commercial and consistent with the current residential charge will be charged per unit. There is a flow charge similar to the ones that commercial currently pays. The flow charge is charged based on one CCF. A CCF is 100 cubic feet and that's equivalent to 748 gallons. So per CCF um, of metered water usage for commercial and then for residential, and we build on that winter average water usage. Winter average is industry standard for wastewater for residential. The, the purpose behind using that is we're trying to estimate as accurately as possible um, the domestic use, the amount of water that's going into the sewer system and not necessarily just all the water that's entering the home. So in the winter, it's primarily domestic. You're not watering lawns or washing cars or filling pools. So that's used um, as the average and that's applied all year round. Of course, she goes a little more detail about this as well. And of course, part of this was uh, rectifying bills between similar folks with different water bills. Um, this is like a study background, just kind of figure out exactly how they're going to do this and how to structure it. Uh, originally, like, uh, um, I don't know if she said it or not, but the, the point was to, uh, um, instead of paying your wastewater utility bill every two years, because they said it was like, no, it's a biannual, so it's every like six months or so, they're figuring out what to make it a more monthly payment, um, just to kind of put it all encompassing into one deal. Uh, and the study was to find those on um, informational setting. Uh, this isn't going to happen anytime soon. The big thing that's, the big change will be happening in January 2021. This is still open to the public comment because anything that's introduced during these public hearings are usually uh, kind of stayed put until um, for another week because, you know, the city council, they can't necessarily meet with the public and they can't kind of do that kind of stuff. So they uh, put the things on public hearings for an extra week to rectify uh, people being able to make public comment, email, call your local city council as well. Um, let's see. And here's some statistics as well. I just want to throw a couple numbers at you. Um, so average, national average is about a $17 a month for wastewater. The average price of water in the United States is about $1.50 for every thousand gallons. Um, of course, at this price, a gallon of water costs less than one penny. Uh, most of the pricing, however, is uh, kind of a flat rate, and they have flow charges, and they also base it all on, like, you know, wintertime, summertime. It, it's, it, they go really in-depth on these studies, and if, if you're interested in water bills and how your water bill is going to change, you can just watch the most of this meeting, but we're not talking about that as much. I just wanted to tell you guys that that's kind of the change that's happening within the city of Missoula. Moving on. <laughs> uh, the thing that took up most of the chunk of this meeting was affordable housing. You talk about affordable housing, you talk about how the city uh, is working with our Missoula, a place called home, uh, f figuring out ways to uh, provide housing, but also uh, provide affordable housing to keep people in Missoula. It's kind of, 
in a way to uh, help the people who live in Missoula to become more uh, um, economically independent, but also creating this new uh, trust. So this was called Affordable Housing Trust Fund Ordinance and Funding Commitment Resolution. Here's Montana James with Housing and Community Development talks a little bit more about this building block. Staff have been working for the past several months on our approach to establishing our local trust fund. In addition to doing research on best practices for local housing trust funds and, and looking at uh, example ordinances from other places across the country, um, including some in New Mexico, California, Oregon, and Massachusetts, we've also collaborated extensively with a variety of our other city departments and leadership, including the clerk's office, the city attorney's office, finance, parks and recreation, public works, transportation, uh, and the Missoula Redevelopment Agency. On a more critical side of public comment, kicked off with a member of the community referring to this trust fund as a slush fund. Um, his audio cut, cut off, but I have uh, Clarissa uh, Truio with uh, the Missoula Home Coalition says that the sh city should be doing more. The coalition would like to see the council increase the annual minimum amount of general fund dollars to be placed in the trust to at least 500,000 per year. Acknowledge in the resolution that housing is a human right. Rename the citizen advisory committee to the citizens oversight committee and require that that committee be comprised of at least 50% renters. We ask that you require the committee to include one member designated by the Missoula Home Coalition and one member designated by Common Good Missoula or such similar organizations as succeed them in the future. We ask that you require annual evaluation and reporting to council of the citizen oversight committee structure and in the selection of membership. The coalition believes that it will be necessary and extremely valuable to give preferential assignment to people from the following groups, black indigenous and people of color, people with disabilities and people who have been incarcerated as well as people who have received housing assistance in the past. Another chunk of the community is people with disabilities, is that with this trust fund, um, it's really hard, it's really easy to help the people who are financially um, in need, but not necessarily people who have disabilities who are in need. And this is Justice Ender speaking on Americans with Disabilities. I'm a citizen and I've also uh, worked somewhere serving a lot of other citizens with disabilities. Um, lack of affordable and accessible housing in Missoula is a constant barrier um, without appropriate housing, transportation, employment. Um, and a lot of other goals can't happen. Uh, I would encourage uh, the city to create this trust fund um, and pay for both new housing and housing modifications for people that have accessible homes um, so people can be diverted from unnecessary institutionalization and participate fully in our communities. Uh, thank you. Vanilla Kyle, uh, a nonprofit called Welcome, speaks it's about pre-release. We help returning citizens find housing. Doing what I do, I meet a lot of good people facing hard times and housing is at the top of their list. I remember when I was looking for housing, it took over four months to do so. Luckily for me, when I did find a home, while at the pre-release, I was able to save money and was able to pay for first, last and security deposit. A lot of the folks I work with either make minimum wage or barely a little above that. It would be a godsend if there was the funding to help them. I understand that times are tough, but if we can come together as a people, united as one, celebrating our diverse cultures here in Missoula, we can build a better tomorrow today. Of course, a lot of folks in those situations have had a break, but nothing as a result of city outreach. Many have had to have uh, find the boots and then the straps to pick themselves up, while others are still working through near homelessness. Um, I'm going to skip ahead, and I'm going to go right over to the city comments, starting with Heidi West. In the world that we live in right now, that's incredibly divisive, and where you know a lot of our uh, conversation uh, seems to be like knee-jerk reactions, and there's wild swings from one political spectrum to the other. Like this fund needs to be insulated and apolitical um, because this is housing that we're talking about, which is a basic human right, and uh, our housing, you know, and our security. Um, as people in our community shouldn't be just up to, you know, people to bat around. Um, Heidi talks about how this addresses housing as a human right and how regulating this goes to help plans in place and make sure this helps people in the future. The trust, you know, uh, comp, uh, com, um, 
a compilation of monies to help people get ho housing vouchers, first and last payment. Just getting into a home is very difficult and also provide ways to uh, um, support renters within the city of Missoula. Uh, and of course, although homeless is not completely gone um, in our community, uh, Mayor John Angan uh, believes the steps taken in the last few years have had a major impact in the city of Missoula. Uh, you know, five years ago, we didn't have a housing office at the city of Missoula. Um, we proposed, uh, I proposed to council that we um, create a position and hire somebody. Uh, and uh, I was, <clears throat> I was uh, pretty dead set on that somebody being Erin Payhan, uh, because I had seen her operate uh, as uh, administrator at the Pavarello Center under very difficult circumstances. I recognized her passion and that passion has translated into action. Um, our housing policy was a slog um, and a necessary slog as much of what we do in local government is. Um, but the product of that slog is a document that um, built the foundation that gives the folks who commented this evening confidence that um, when we create this housing trust fund as a function of that planning document, uh, that it will be meaningful and effective. Um, they are always open to having people on boards and discussing and all that stuff. You can reach out to the City of Missoula by logging onto the website ci.missoula.mt.us. You can uh, search, you can find your ward representation, find out what ward you're in, and then find your ward representation. You can talk to them. They will refer to you to the right people. But also, uh, one of the big things is that the Office of Housing and Planning, Erin Peehan, uh, she used to work for the Pavarella Center, and she's a good representation of helping people get homes from that very um, at-risk uh, position for a lot of folks as well. Um, but once again, Erin Peehan with the Office of Housing and Development in the City of Missoula. You can check that out. Um, but yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for my City Council report. Um, and I'll be right back. Here is the most latest update on COVID-19 within the city of Missoula. Hi, my name is Cindy Farr and I'm the Incident Commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Thursday, July 16th, and this is my daily briefing. To date, we've had 151 cumulative positive cases in Missoula County. 148 of those were identified by testing and three were epi-linked. We've had 106 recoveries and one death. One Missoula County resident remains hospitalized, and we currently have 44 active COVID-19 cases with over 350 close contacts. Active cases and their known contacts are in quarantine and isolation and will continue to be monitored and supported as needed. The state of Montana is reporting 2,231 cumulative cases, which is up 134 cases since yesterday. There are now 1,226 active cases with 37 active hospitalizations across the state, and there have been 35 deaths related to COVID-19. Yesterday, Governor Bullock held a press conference announcing a mandatory face covering rule in certain settings in Montana counties with four or more active cases. This is a welcome directive that's in alignment with our local operations. We're, we ho are hopeful that the statewide mandate, when used in conjunction with other safety practices, will help slow COVID-19. Remember that the idea is to distribute the positive cases more evenly across time so that our healthcare hub and healthcare infrastructure can keep pace with COVID-19 without working beyond their capacity. We will st still continue seeing cases, but this will help slow the spread and distribute it across time. There are some facets of the governor's rule that are stricter than our local rule and health officer order, and there are some components of the local rule and health officer order that are stricter than those from the state. So I'd like to review and clarify what the mandate looks like in Missoula County for Missoula County residents as well as all visitors to Missoula County. Typically, the stricter of the two is what is followed, and I'll outline what those differences are and how we'll move forward from here. First, the governor's directive requires that people age five and older wear face coverings in certain settings. Our local order, our, our local rule and order require that people ages 12 and older wear face coverings in certain settings. Since the governor's directive is stricter, Missoula County follows the state mandate and requires all people age five and older wear face coverings. Second, the governor's directive allows for face shields in replacement of face coverings, while the Missoula rule does not allow for that. In Missoula County, face shields are not a replacement for face coverings, and we, we continue requiring the use of face coverings until further notice. 
Remember that the face covering should have a good fit for your face. Fully cover your nose and mouth and have a snug seal at the base of the chin, ensuring that your respiratory droplets do not escape from above or below the face covering. Third, the governor's directive is contingent upon the number of active cases in your county. Local rule and order are not dependent upon the number of active cases in the county. As such, our local order and rule will continue being in place until further notice. Our Board of Health and Health Officer will um, reassess the rule, including implementation, compliance, enforcement, and its effect on COVID trends in our county on a monthly basis. In addition to standing monthly meetings, the Board of Health, Health Officer, and Incident Commander remain in communication, ensuring that leadership is apprised of the information in real time so that they can make informed decisions in real time as needed. So that was a lot of information, and I'll review it once more just to verify that we're all on the same page. In Missoula County, people ages five and older are required to wear face coverings when inside public settings, as well as when they are outside in certain settings per the governor's directive. In Missoula County, face coverings are required. Face shields are not an admissible replacement for a face covering until and if and when the Board of Health and Health Officer revisit and amend the rule and order indicating otherwise. Finally, in Missoula County, people are required to wear face coverings until further notice, regardless of the number of active cases in our county. Several states have implemented man mandatory face covering rules in the past few weeks. We're proud to be the first county in Montana and one of the first states to formally adopt a rule for public health and safety. With the rise in the required face coverings, we've also seen a rise in scams that are related to things um, that are being called mask ID or mask exemption IDs that are supposedly issued and endorsed by agencies like the Department of Justice and the CDC. We saw this start happening in other states and have already passed fa that have already passed face covering rules before us, and now we're seeing it in our state and county. We've seen ads in our local newspaper as well as on social media suggesting that that there are mask exemption cards for sale. These cards are not valid and they will not be accepted if and when presented to indicate that you are exempt from the rule. The Department of Justice formally announced today that those who may see a card or flyer with a DOJ logo stating that the owner or wearer is exempt from wearing a face covering have not actually been endorsed or issued by the Department of Justice. Health experts, huh, let me try that one again. Health experts and the Department of Justice also urged the public not to believe in the claim that wearing a mask will incur mental or physical risk as described by these fake exemption cards. Sometimes the cards claim that Americans with Disabilities Act forbids asking about the cardholder's health condition aggravated by wearing a mask. The card threatens that if questions were asked, financial penalties of up to $75,000 or higher can be levied, and that is not accurate and it is totally misinformation. An official alert from the Department of Justice and the um, ADA states that they are not the distributors, nor do they endorse the information on those cards that are being distributed. We've also seen other cards with misinformation being created and distributed, indicating that a face covering is unhealthy and ineffective, which is not true. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommends wearing a face, a face mask or face covering when going out in public as a way to slow the spread of COVID-19, along with social distancing and hand washing. It's unfortunate that scams like this are happening. We strongly encourage people to do your homework. If something feels weird, it probably is. It's unfortunate that some people will try to take advantage of others, especially at a time like this with a situation as serious as this, but it does happen. So remain diligent and practice those safe behaviors. Mask up, wash your hands, clean, 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 and keep your social circles small. Connect with our call center at 258-INFO if and when you have questions that need clarification or if you'd like to schedule a test for COVID-19 if you're having symptoms. There's so much information coming out in real time. We're here to help, so definitely use us as a resource. So that's it for my daily briefing today. As always, you can um, follow us on Facebook at the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page. Please be respectful of your fellow citizens there. Um, you can call 258-INFO if you would like to schedule a test for COVID-19. Or again, if you have any questions, um, you can certainly call that number. Um, check out our website at missoula.co slash cvirus for more information and guidance. And as always, you can subscribe to me on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr. That's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. -R. Click that little notification bell so that you get notified whenever additional videos are uploaded. And... 
that's it for today. Everybody be healthy, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Yep, we are getting closer and closer to the end of the show, and I wanted to thank you guys for joining me on this morning. Um, no major announcements happening with MCAT as well. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, recall is that MCAT has been doing a lot of uh, meetings, a lot of Zoom meetings that we've been broadcasting on our channel. There's been a couple uh, places that I've been in contact with as well, just be like, Hey, um, are you guys still doing your meetings? I know that you, you know, it's hard for us to kind of come out and film your meetings when you can't even um, gather. Is there a way that we could maybe get a copy of some of these Zoom meetings that you've done? And so if you have an organization, civic um, board of commissions or anything like that that you want uh, MCAT to broadcast um, and send out there in media and put it on our website as well for people who don't have um, MCAT on channel 189 Charter Spectrum. Uh, you can get in contact with us. Our number is 542-6228. But the best way to get in contact with us is emailing us at MCAT at MCAT.org. MCAT at MCAT.org. It is so easy. Really easy. All right. So once again, thank you guys for joining me. And for Wickham Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Take care, guys.